Whenever I think of frustration or anxiety, I feel as though it's a dark, stormy cloud inside of my mind. All of these different, distracting thoughts become all-consuming. When I run, I just get into this meditative state. I channel that anger or frustration and feel that cloud start to dissipate. I had an eating disorder for five years, and that's because I kept silent about it. Publicly sharing my story helped me recover and helped me accept myself. So it's my senior year of high school. I've been interning for This Is My Brave for about six months now. This Is My Brave is a nonprofit that helps people share their mental health stories, and they really helped me when I wanted to talk about my mental health. And through them, I met other teens who wanted to share their experiences too. I thought, why not start a podcast so we can all share? I'm really excited, but also am quite nervous. So wish me luck. It's all about starting the conversation. And that's why I'm doing this podcast. Our turn to talk, to share real stories of teens like me. In this season, we'll hear from Morgan, a teen hockey player from Chicago who's facing off against stigma, on and off the ice. And you shouldn't be ashamed to talk about what's going on in your head because it doesn't make you any less tough. It just makes you human. Young Elder, a community activist from Baltimore, Maryland. What we're experiencing right now is called community trauma. Dylan, a high school football star from Glenbrook, Illinois. You see kind of the guys that separate themselves with the mental side of the game versus the physical side of the game. And River, a transgender teen living in North Carolina. I always had pressure on me to be something that I wasn't. I was really shocked that there's actual scientific research, that storytelling truly saves lives. You can literally help other people just by speaking out and being honest about what you've been through. Our generation is speaking up about our mental health. I'm Anastasia Vlasova and I'm 18 years old. This is our turn to talk. I really like uplifting, upbeat music. I basically like songs that make me see bright colors. I'm a huge believer in the law of attraction and like manifestation, and all of that spiritual hippy dippy stuff. And I like experimenting with a lot of different art forms, pop art, and I love comic pop art type stuff. I usually turn to drawing because I just get lost in the actual practice of art rather than focusing on what's going through my mind. I've always been a kid who was very ambitious and being a Russian person <laughs> with parents who grew up in the Soviet Union, I had that mindset of get over it, deal with it. You should be grateful for where you're at. And if there's something that I want, I need to work for it, train for it, whatever, and get it done.
when I was in seventh grade, that was kind of the height of my tennis performance. And I wanted to share that with people. And it's a little bit embarrassing even to admit that I kind of wanted to be a little fitness influencer. But at first it was super fun. A few months into having the account, it started to take a turn for the worst. I became really obsessed with all of the follower count, the likes, the amount of comments. I was basing my self-worth off of the numbers. Say I would post something on Monday and then I wake up and in the morning I'm brushing my teeth. All of a sudden, the thought of the post floats into my mind. And then I start thinking, was my caption good enough? No, 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 or did I look good in this? Because I would look at images of these fitness influencers and I would compare myself to them. I just felt so much pressure to just always be perfect. that changed the way that I viewed food and made me restrict a lot of times, but then my severe restriction led to binging, which then turned into a full-on eating disorder. I had no one to turn to because I felt so ashamed and embarrassed to talk to friends or family about it. So I went to my counselor and she's someone that I trusted deeply. She asked how she could help. I told her that I was struggling a lot with food, especially with body image and exercise. How I used to love tennis, but couldn't deal with the pressure of staying fit anymore. The guilt I felt for eating a cupcake after lunch. That I couldn't get a handle on my eating. And she had a bit of a smirk on her face, and she said, so you're upset because you ate an extra cupcake? She basically just laughed in my face about it. She was completely invalidating what I was feeling. I shut my mouth, and I kept quiet for the next few years of my life. Four and a half, to be exact. And I struggled deeply with anxiety and depression as a result. For too many of us, stigma around mental illness means bullying, rejection, and discrimination. This podcast is about teens saying enough is enough. Mental health is a problem. We need to talk. If I hadn't talked about it, I wouldn't be sitting here. It is not dramatic or attention seeking to talk about your mental health issues. And not only is it okay to talk about this stuff, it's incredibly important. People's lives can be destroyed if we don't talk about mental health issues. I didn't really know much about mental health, like about trauma and things like that. Like you always hear words like that. But it's like, you know, what does that really mean for me? I've definitely struggled with like anxiety and mental health struggles for like, I mean, all my life. I think to myself, how could I have possibly survived that? There's no shame in seeking help. Trust me when I say that there's help out there and that things do get better. Sometimes you gotta know what the dark is to see the light. It is okay to struggle. No one talks about it because it's scary. I mean, it's not something that you can see. It's not visible. You want me to go first? When I was growing up, anything that my brother and sister did, I had to be better at it. One day my brother was like, hey, I really want to try hockey. And I found my love for the game. It's super fast. You have to keep up, clear your mind. It 
it's guided me through the years. And, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I could always just go on the ice. Especially last year with my depression and anxiety. I was having these panic attacks and crying a lot. My hands would shake. I couldn't breathe. I had no motivation to be at the rink anymore. My parents always taught me that if I needed help, it was okay to ask. We thought, this might be a great time to tell my coach kind of what's going on. The next day, my dad said, you were being removed from the team. You can't be at any tournaments, you can't be around the team, you can't go to any practices because you were considered a danger. My hockey coach sent a email to the rest of the team parents that did not include my parents. One of the lines in it was, we don't want any other child to carry the burden of Morgan. You know, I was at a super low point and hearing this made me go back even farther. So my goal then was just to keep myself alive. hockey player involved in an unusual lawsuit. She is suing the Team Illinois Hockey Club and the Amateur Hockey Association of Illinois for discrimination. Their attorney says this incident is a clear violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act. It wasn't even about me anymore. We wanted them to put mental health programs in place to help the coaches and the athletes, they still haven't done it. So we are deciding to sue because we don't want this ever to happen to anyone again. Okay, but well, we could just hang out in my room until then. Okay, cool. Your butt is big and so is your heart. Yeah, that's what my sister wrote. <laughs> What's up, Margie? Hi. Rob, I want you to meet my new friend. Hi, I'm Anastasia, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I just got off the ice. Got done some hockey. Got oh. some golf today. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I mean, you're a big hockey star. You could have just gone on, lived your life, but instead you'd invest a lot of time helping Morgan. So why do you do that? Well, Morgan's story hit really close to home for me, how she was treated. And that was something that I went through as well. In the pro sports, a lot of guys power through it and just try to put it to the side. And it's a tricky line because you don't want to be passed up. Right. I feel like a lot of young athletes especially experience these conflicting mindsets. So why do you think it's important to talk about your emotions and not suppress them? You know, I, I lost a big amount of time by just powering through and not getting to know myself. And it's time, now I'm in my 30s and trying to go backwards and figure it out piece by piece, so to speak. So I think it's valuable to educate the youth now and understand of what means powering through and what means addressing. I can speak from depression. It doesn't have to be hidden. Right. Whether it might be therapy, whether it might be medication, it's something that you can be going through and also be an athlete. We've thankfully found the medicine that she thrives with the best. And we don't look at this as a negative. We liken it more to someone who's diabetic and needs that insulin to survive. The biggest thing that my psychiatrist told me was like, it's not gonna work right away. So like, don't be mad if in like a week you're not feeling better. That was really hard for me to wrap my head around. This has been a great way for her to learn other tools that she wouldn't have otherwise been able to use had she still been in such a low, unmedicated place. And we're still supplementing that with her therapist and with yoga and with her daily exercise. This is where I work out like three times a week. It's called base. This is our leaderboard, so it's like there's different exercises on here. Have you ever been on the leaderboard? Yeah, so I'm right here. Oh, yeah. Bench, hang clean. Oh, up dang. here and then bench over here. That's yeah. awesome. All right, are you ready to go work out? Yes, Let's I am. do it. All right. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. How many more? <laughs> there you go. You feel it? I do, yeah, yeah. 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 
How has working out helped you like recover from your oh, muscle? So much. Now, it, honestly, when I think about the gym, I get a little bit emotional because I feel like the gym was a great place where I could track my progress and that just made me feel strong and good in my body, which is such a difference from how I used to feel about it. So. Yeah, that's how I am yeah. too. And I feel like when I'm really bad mentally, I can come in here and work out and, you know, like take a step back and say like, hey, Morgan, like, what do you need? You know, if I had hurt my back and I had to tell my coach that I had to sit out of practice, he'd say, you know, do whatever you need to do to get back on the ice. For my mental health, it was either you're 100% in or you're 100% out. And you shouldn't be ashamed to talk about what's going on in your head because it doesn't make you any less tough. It just makes you human. It's crazy the power that vulnerability holds. I mean, the best memories of my life and the best parts of my life happened after I said that I needed help. I was diagnosed with clinical depression and anxiety when I was 13 years old. Now that I'm more open about my story, I can more easily accept how I feel. When I talk about the assault, I always tell people that that day I felt like I lost a piece of myself and I still feel like I'm still trying to get her back. But um, that day something changed. You know, there was a part of me that I knew would never quite be the same. The bullying just continued years and years on. I never told anyone. After the accident, the one night the nurse walked in and she was like, you know you're never gonna be able to walk again, right? Everything in me just lost all hope. Sometimes it felt like I was just in a room screaming and it was like, no one can hear me. I was hospitalized a few times and it's been a journey and I'm not quite out of the woods yet. What if you're ready to tell your story, but other people in your life, like your parents or friends, don't think you should? That's kind of the conflict that I encountered when I was applying to college. As I sat down to write my essay, I couldn't help but think, well, I have to include something about my mental illness experience. I was talking with my mom about it, and she was saying that it might not be the best idea because the college admissions officers might view that as a liability. They want to see a success story. Which is a bummer because like, I'm 18. Like there are so many people still figuring their lives out. Like I'm still figuring my life out. People are a total work in progress and mental illness is something that you simply learn to cope with. At that point, I thought, listen, if NYU or all the other schools that I'm applying to don't want to admit me as I am, then they're probably not the right school for me. Something that I've noticed is if something's off with someone, we ask the question, what's wrong with you? When instead, we should be asking, what's happened to you? I had this really awesome opportunity to meet someone who's asking that question to a whole community. Her name is Young Elder. She's an activist in Baltimore. People call me Young Elder because people used to always say that I was ahead of my time. You know, I was an old soul. And in my music, I'd like to shed wisdom on my peers and not just give up when things get rough. I'm still standing, they try to knock me down, but I'm, I'm still standing. Yeah, I got knocked around, but I'm, I'm still standing, I'm still standing. See, I come from a city where you grind to survive. The devil whispering in my ears, he been telling me lies. I know you thought that it was over, but I'm back, you surprised. See, I will remain focused, I ain't never giving up. Oh, I fell. Oh, shit. You made a 
post the other day, I think it said, like, stop selling haircuts. Stop selling your time. Yes, that's that. important. No, for you real, know, though. Time valuable. Hate wasting it, too. Especially with the whole college thing. My first semester was really rough, but I have a lot to say. Uh -huh. And in order for people to listen, they gonna be like, where you go to school? Where you go to school? You know? Uh -huh. Kind of just taking advantage of that. Uh -huh. And I mean, one thing I know about Baltimore, it's not an environment that make you want to grow. That's that generational curse. Now, I feel like a lot of our peers, where they lose hope, is trying to find out who they are and what they want to do in life. Like that. Like one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm liking that. Looking good. Sometimes I forget that I'm black. I forget that because of the complexion of my skin, things aren't going to be as easy for me. It takes a toll on your mental because a lot of times you feel like you can't do it. You just start to lose hope when you look around and you don't have any role models who look like you that can really kind of make you feel alone and isolated. I used to be afraid to tell people that I question my sexuality, tried suicide. I was sexually abused as a child. I don't hold it back anymore because I know I'm not the only person that has experienced this. And what I had to realize is holding on to pain and animosity wasn't helping me grow. It was just keeping me angry, and I wanted peace. Through time, through therapy, through music, through friendship, I was able to heal. And seeing how trauma has affected the people in my community, horribly. A history of trauma that continues to go unaddressed is a major factor contributing to the crime and violence. This week, 10 people were killed. Several others were injured in shootings, including a 14 year old girl just yesterday. People are living in these communities where these shootings are happening almost daily and they're just fed up. When I saw um, like somebody shot and killed for the first time, it opened my eyes completely. One black boy dying really shakes the whole city. We don't see it as just a number. We see it as, that's real, like that's, that's somebody's son. And, and he added purpose to this city. He added purpose to this world. Right here is the Freddie Gray mural. They painted this after the Freddie Gray riots in 2015. He was arrested, and the police officers handled him, like, really abusively, and they ended up breaking his spine, and it was caught on tape. The police didn't get convicted, and that really made people angry. You see, like, right here, that was exactly what it looked like during the riots. In that moment, all over the country, people were looking at Baltimore as, like, a violent place, but in reality, it was kind of a cry for help. For so long, we kept saying, like, it's not okay to treat us like that. How old were you at the time? I was in seventh grade, and it was hard for me to process all of this. It was something i never seen before. I was scared. Did you and your family ever talk about all of the events that had occurred? No, we didn't really it? talk about it either. All we talked about was, don't go outside. You know, it's just not safe outside. Right. But in reality, we need to talk about it. And as you can see, Baltimore was going to talk about it. So the key is to address these situations when yeah. they happen and not just keep pushing them down. Somewhere in America, whether that's an inner city area, whether that's a rural area, there's a community that's struggling to get their basic needs met. And that does something uh, chemically, neurologically to the brain to where it puts you in a persistent state of fight or flight. And they're bringing those stressors inside of school buildings and they're being asked 
to learn. We're all gonna experience trauma in some form, small, big, we're gonna experience it. Now, I'm all about healing my city. You know, they say hurt people hurt people, but I believe in healed people healed people. We are the first city in America to legislate trauma-informed care into our city governance. I'll repeat that, the first in America to legislate trauma-informed care. Council member Zeke Cohen wanted me to be a part of the trauma-informed care task force. Like it's an actual law that we have to train people who interact with our young people and interact with our community about triggers, teach people about sympathy and empathy, and properly address trauma. The other part of healing our city is our young people. And that's why we've been so glad to work with Young Elder, who is an amazing young leader, also a member of the Trauma-Informed Care Task Force. It's my great honor to welcome Young Elder. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I really do want to speak for the youth that walk down the street every day past blocks of abandoned buildings, and it just makes me so angry, y'all. Because I'm, I'm, I'm only 19. Like, how can I possibly be successful if all I see is trash, if all I see is abandoned buildings? I don't know what hope looks like. Yeah. We all gonna have to come together like this because what we're experiencing right now is called community trauma. Yeah. We, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a therapist. You can, you just have to care. That was really, really good. I appreciate I was, it. Yeah, I was impressed, I'm like, moved, all inspired. Dumb, I know, <laughs> I know. I was like, that you, and I was like, you're telling me you didn't write a single thing down. No, I wow. appreciate it. I just really admire everything that you're doing. It means doing. so much to me. Yeah, and it's like, right, if you think right, about right, it, like, right. this is not really the work that I would want to do. Like, right. it's the work that I was chosen to do. Yeah. So, I just do it. So as y'all can see, I got J. Cole on the wall and Lauryn Hill, those two my favorite artists. And listening to J. Cole taught me that whether I'm making music or whether I'm speaking to the masses, it's about talking about the truth. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Anastasia. This is a song that I wrote called Make It Out. So what's the backstory? Somebody told me, you know, if you ain't go through nothing, you ain't gonna have nothing to talk about. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was basically trying to figure out what was I gonna say next. Sing it live. All right, up there, <laughs> sing it live. So there's an African proverb, it's called Mbutu, which means I am because we are. It expresses that we, we go through pain together. Like, it's not just a black thing, it's everywhere. Don't nobody know your pain, so I just take the blame, cause I ain't put it in my songs, cause sometimes I would feel ashamed. But I know that we gon' make it out, we gon' make it out, I know Young Elder was telling me that mental health is really stigmatized in black communities. And so it's hard to talk about what you're going through because people start looking at you differently. My family went through something similar. My family went through something similar. I was born in Moscow, Russia. 
I remember spending a lot of time outdoors. My grandma's house was like this really run down old turquoise colored house with the paint peeling off of the exterior walls. I think that's kind of where my love for the outdoors came from. It felt like it was straight out of a fairy tale. And there was a playground that my dad built. He was very adventurous and I think that's something that I got from him. We moved to the U.S. when I was five years old. There definitely was tension between my parents following the move here. My dad was less able to adjust to the change, and my parents had very different communication styles. That impacted me and my sister. Growing up, my parents rarely talked about their own struggles. For example, my dad deals with his emotions by sometimes turning to alcohol or to food for comfort instead of actually talking about it, having open conversations. And the message was very clear when it came to mental health challenges. You should be able to tough it out and get over them. That's what contributed to me suppressing my emotions for so long. I'm a mental health professional and someone who struggles with my own mental health. And I wanna remind you guys that it's actually pretty rare that people will fake having a mental illness. But what's very common is for people to fake being okay when they're actually not. Of course you don't want everyone to know or see what you're going through, but at the same time you want someone to dig a little deeper. I, I did hide it from my peers and my friends. I wasn't sure if you know, I should wait for someone else to realize or if I should reach out for help. I invalidated my emotions a lot. I bottled up my emotions, telling myself like, oh, you're not sad, like, just get over it. This is nobody else's problem. It's in my head. I'm the reason why this is happening. The words my guidance counselor used were that, I am a liability. Snap out of it. What's wrong with you? Stop worrying so much. The things that you've been through, it's not something that you can just get over or just snap out of. In order to break that stigma, we really have to accept that mental health is health. For most people, from the time they develop a mental health problem to the time they actually seek help is anywhere from eight to 10 years. From my experience with my dad, I learned that men and boys, they're not taught to talk openly about their feelings. In this episode of Our Turn to Talk, I want to tell you about Dylan Buckner. With a last name like Buckner, you know, people called me Buck all my life. It was pretty natural for Dylan to pick that up. You know, he came home from school one day and he was like, Dad, 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 we can play tackle football and everybody's signing up. Can you sign me up? Pretty soon after, he wanted to be the quarterback, throwing the ball even back then. And Dylan threw a beautiful spiral. The last season as a junior, he clips the prior record for most passing completions. He started on varsity as a sophomore. My name is uh, Dylan Buckner, and the biggest thing I realized out here today was you see kind of the guys that separate themselves with the mental side of the game versus the physical side of the game. He had very high hopes for what he'd be able to accomplish as a senior, but uh, you know that's not the way it, not the way it worked out. So this is where we've been keeping all the letters and things people brought, much of which we haven't, you know, I guess emotional strength to read through some of it we have. Got a lot of wristbands. Loyalty over royalty was a saying of his. Kids left their jerseys. Buck, we all strive to be as great of a friend and teammate as you were. See, there's just stacks of them here. It's nice that they were, you know, still, still went a lot to them. I know Dylan had a lot of friends. A 
for us, there was no sign. There was no, no warning. This is a senior picture here. You know, all the symptoms, they're sleeping a lot or they're not sleeping at all, or they're isolated. Dylan really never exhibited any of the other symptoms you might read about. We learned after his September attempt, he was battling depression on a daily basis, oftentimes on an hourly basis, and sometimes on a minute by minute basis for a couple years. When I would look at other kids and their relationship with their siblings, it was very much a love-hate relationship where for me and Dylan, there was none of that. I always looked up to him because of his achievements. Most of the time, he kept things away from me, I think, out of fear. He was so worried about just being a burden to other people or putting a burden onto someone else. You know, we got him all the inpatient and outpatient therapy that we could, and we tried all the different medications, and he was trying very hard. He was trying to do the exercises, trying to learn the skills. Dylan was super structured and kind of a perfectionist. So to have a mental health problem was kind of like, this wasn't planned for. I truly believe being in the heart of COVID, he didn't have any of those other things to go to. So for him, not having that structure left him very much at loose ends. You think when it's your kid, it'll kind of be this rational process where your kid will come to you, you know, three separate times. That was not our experience. And that's why I call it kind of the silent killer because Dylan hit his depression. Our mental health became so bad during the pandemic that health officials declared a state of emergency. Here are the statistics for 12 to 17 year olds. In the first eight months of the pandemic, emergency room visits for mental health went up over 30%. Suspected suicide attempts for girls went up over 50%. It was 4% for boys. But the truth is, teens were struggling way before the pandemic and were going to be long after. For the most part, Dylan kept things to himself, but he did begin to open up to one person, and that was his best friend, Anthony. We'd come and just line up cones over here, and every day we'd do like something different, or really just be with each other, and, you know, try to take away some of the pain that uh, he was feeling. Here you go. he would get it perfect at the end of the day, which was amazing. I'm just really curious to see like why you've become so open about talking uh, about your feelings and mental health. Dylan actually helped me through like a, like a hard point in my life. I take meds for anxiety and ADHD. I would get in trouble a lot up until like eighth grade in school because mm -hmm. I was very like hyperactive. Yeah. I would call out and stuff. So it was kind of like even harder to, you know, build like a relationship with people and like have them like care. Yeah. And people like when they tell you like your reason is not a legitimate reason to mm -hmm. be sad or something like yeah. that kind of like even messes with your mind more. It's hard to open up as a boy too because people think like you're supposed to not cry and stuff. No one should ever be afraid of asking for help. Society has these ideas about what teens with mental illness look like. So it's harder for those of us who are struggling to speak up. Here's the thing, mental illness does not look a certain way. The naysayers that I get say, which is, you know, oh, well, you must have missed something or, yeah. you know, this will never happen to me. You know, my kid has a good life. And I would say, well, you know, I, I would worry about the kid, you know, that you're not worried about because, yeah. you know, Dylan was a model student and very inclusive and, you know, such a self-starter. There's a lot of kids who are super ambitious and academically inclined and Working in mental health it just makes me realize how many people also experience mental illness. You know, I just started to say to people that, uh, you know, to me, mental illness is, 
is absolutely an illness. It's not, you know, being weak-minded. It's not a phase. It's not part of growing up. You know, there's yeah. somebody on your block in your neighborhood that's struggling. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. You know, we need to talk about it more. I was diagnosed with depression in sixth grade. Therapy and antidepressants were extremely effective. They helped me have a better mindset. But even then, it's definitely not easy to kind of open up about that. If it was easy, my brother would have done it. Do you come in here often? I used to just to feel like I could be with them more. Depression isn't going to be something that your body is going to deal with on its own. You are going to need to deal with that by being proactive. My hope is that I can be the helping hand that Dylan was to more people. But most importantly, making sure people talk to their parents about it or go to therapy or talk to a trained professional because I can't do as much as everyone else can. And yeah, I'm a 16-year-old kid. But what I do know is that I've been through the hardest day of my life already. And it might be small bits, but it's getting better. I think the scariest part is that moment when you reach out to a friend and you say, I need to talk to you. And then they say, OK, what's up? And now it's your turn to kind of spill everything. And the reality is that we put more pressure on ourselves instead of just learning to accept ourselves and to seek help when we need it. Dear Journal, I'm pissed at myself. I feel disappointed in myself. I feel like I never get enough SHIT done and that I'm not making enough progress. Ugh, and I'll get to that place where I can just be much more kind to myself. <laughs> but <laughs> taking care of your mental health and learning to manage anxiety and growing up it's hard. A few months ago, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal reached out to me and she said, let's talk about Instagram. Instagram can be damaging for many teenagers' mental health, most notably teenage girls. And Facebook knows it. For the past three years, the social media giant has been conducting studies. 32% of teen girls say when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse. It's obviously extremely difficult when you open up your phone and you see this feed of endless amounts of perfect photos. Using the app led to an increase of anxiety and depression. 6% of American users trace the desire to kill themselves to Instagram. And one of the things I'm, I'm saddest when I look on Twitter is when people blame the parents for these problems with Facebook. They say, just take your kid's phone away. And the reality is those issues are a lot more complicated than that. Very rarely do you have one of these generational shifts where parents have such a different set of experiences that they don't have the context to support their children in a safe way. Facebook's own research says kids today feel like they are struggling alone with all these issues. When she got to high school, Anastasia says her mental health problems got worse. I went to my counselor one day and I said, I'm, just, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Like, I don't want to be here. I told her, I don't want to be here anymore. I hate myself. I hate how much I have disconnected from my friends and just from who I truly am because of this stupid eating disorder and my depression and my anxiety. And I don't know what to do. And it got to a point where I started to take digital detoxes. I deleted the account for a bit, got it back, deleted it again. That cycle went on for a while, but it's like this silent addiction that creeps up on you. The algorithms are very smart in the sense that they latch on to things that people want to continue to engage with. And unfortunately, in the case of teen girls and things like self-harm, they develop these feedback cycles where children are using Instagram to self-soothe 
but then are exposed to more and more content that makes them hate themselves. I was noticing these patterns over the past like four or five years, you know, I didn't need this research investigation to conclude that, hey, Instagram is bad for me. I'm just really proud of myself that I was able to eliminate it from my life. And I could truly start my mental health healing process once I had deleted the app from my phone permanently. What I've learned through therapy is that all people want when they're struggling mentally is validation. LGBTQ plus, yes or no? Yes. This is what. What's wrong, sweetheart? In this episode of Our Turn to Talk, River Evans invites us into her world. Disappointment child check. Let's go. Put a finger down if you've ever snuck out. Put a finger down if you've ever been grounded. If your parents disapprove of how you dress. If you've ever colored your hair a bright color. If you've ever failed a class. Put a finger down if you've ever been suspended, expelled, or dropped out of school. If you've been diagnosed with a mental or personality illness slash disorder. I'm holy disorder. And put a finger down if you're gay. In third grade, when I would go to art class, the oil pastels would rub off on your skin, and I would act like it was lipstick. Whenever I saw other women growing up, I wanted to be like them. This was my post to see if I had a glow up. So it said, post a picture of you from two years ago, one year, a month, and then that day. So this was back in August. I think I had a great glow up. I'm hot now, oh my gosh. If only I really felt like that. Growing up in Nashville, North Carolina, this is a very small town in the South. You know pretty much everybody. People aren't exactly open-minded when it comes to talking about mental health. Mm, I had a bowl cut. Yeah, you liked your bowl cut. No, I and liked having hair. There's my baby in the NICU. I was so cute as a baby. What happened? You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. Oh, thank you. I was fishing. I oh, know. <laughs> so sweet. How many times you gonna put that name? Everywhere. Every single page. It's right there. I like your name. Mm. Liked it. Loved it. Oh. Yeah, well, that was your name. You were ready for some toys. There are a lot of things I wish my parents understood better, like referring to someone with the correct pronouns, referring to them by their name. I always had pressure on me to be something that I wasn't. It caused this deep sadness, and it never really went away. I need you to get the butter out. Salt, pepper, butter, and that. I started noticing a change in middle school. He'd be happy one minute, and then upset the next minute, mad, angry, ready to fight, and then he was back to a sweet, loving self the next time you see him. Gradually, it got worse, because he wanted to make everybody happy. But he was wrestling with himself. I didn't tell my family until I was 13 that I was trans, and they were not supportive at all. I felt very alone in my own house. Thank you for all you've done for us and all you continue to do. And just thank you, man. So it was a difficult time. We were in the midst of trying to deal with your child that you've known like this for so long has come to you and said, yeah, that's, that's not me. He would call me 
you know, faggot, uh, fairy. So we'd like yell and scream, and then we started getting into fist fights. And I remember the cops had ended up being called twice. It all got worse in school. A lot of my problems came from teachers and not even the other students. Do you see what I see when you're looking at me and I'm staring in the mirror? Do you know what it's like to always wonder why you can't see who you are any clearer? I was 13 when I called the suicide hotline. While I was in the hospital, I realized music was the biggest help. When you can't hold on anymore. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, type two, PTSD, anxiety, ADHD, and gender dysphoria. Getting the diagnosis made it 10 times easier to talk about it. These papers are from his psychological evaluation. This was the first time they had gone into detail to try to break everything down. And then they explained to us what we needed to do differently. Being transgender or LGBTQ plus like me is not a choice. But being an ally to the LGBTQ plus community like me is a choice. Did you know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people? LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. One, accepting adults can decrease an LGBTQ young person's risk of suicide by 40%. I mean, even though, you know, we feel like we're past that point, you know, it's still hard to talk about, you know, your, your, your child telling you they don't want to live anymore. <sighs> you know, you really have to make sure that you don't get in your own way of being that support person for them. Whether we fully understand or not, we have to change the way that we parent and the way that we understand who our child has become. Some days are more difficult than others, but they need us. Since I now have that support from my family, I do feel a responsibility to be that voice that others need. Do an interview with you? Uh, Maybe? Yes, gotcha. Makes sense. Okay, bye. Let's see it. Yeah, I love it. It's so cute. What kind of makeup look are you going for? I'm not entirely sure yet. So this is actually my first live performance and I'm actually kind of nervous. 
But we'll see what happens. Alright guys, without further ado, Ribbon. To share my story has been very nerve-wracking, but growing up, if I heard other people talking about and explaining their mental health, maybe I would have realized sooner there were others out there that were like me. It also would have helped me to see that it gets better. So what do you think music has taught you about yourself? It's one of my only healthy coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I was 13 and I wrote about the voices in my head telling me you're not good enough, you're never gonna make it, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And then I recorded a song called Two-Faced mm -hmm. about having bipolar disorder. Mm. And I have a lot of intrusive thoughts. When I first started writing it out, I realized I am terrified of myself most of the time that's what I'm aiming to fix. Not really to be less afraid of the world, but to be less afraid of my own mind. Mm -hmm. Even the adults who struggle with mental illness don't believe that we're old enough to understand and don't believe that we really know what we're talking about. And so because of that, a lot of teens don't try to get help. I personally look up to those who are able to be so open. I tried a lot of stuff by myself that ultimately didn't work until I started therapy. And luckily I'm in the recovery stage and I actually, I would say that I don't even have the eating disorder anymore. But I still live with generalized anxiety disorder. It's really important to know myself super well and to be able to turn to journaling or going outside and knowing what my healthy coping mechanisms for anxiety and depression are. I've learned to express my needs to my friends and family when I need help with my anxiety. That's why I continue storytelling because I'm standing up and I'm speaking out about the things that have been holding me back for so long, but I'm no longer letting them have power over me. I'm taking power over them. Dude, does anyone have safety pins? I have like a bunch. Oh, I have a body thank pin you. for my hat because, yeah. It just hit me that we're all graduating today. Yep. <laughs> Life just moves so fast. I know. <laughs> Wait, did I ever tell you guys that Miss Flesh gave me this book called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be? Because I was so stressed out about college. Is that for us? Wow. What's up? Ah! I think over the past year, I've realized through talking with so many different people there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to mental illness. What side are we supposed to put our toss in? Right side. I looked it up. Okay. Wait, is this the, is this the one? It doesn't just go away. 
you just learn to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. It's starting, man. We're graduating. The adults in our lives, whether they're therapists or parents or teachers or coaches, they play a large role in constructing our support system. But I think sometimes there's difficulty communicating our emotional needs to older generations. Which, you know, I'm not blaming them for it because that's how they were raised, because their parents were raised that way and so on and so forth. You know, it's a generational thing. You don't know what you don't know. And they didn't know that talking about mental health would actually help them. IB Diploma candidate, Anastasia Plasova. And we want to change that because we know that we can all live a much better life and we're willing to fight for that. Most of what we need is just someone to listen and someone who will actually take the time to try to understand and to try to help us get help. So if you're an adult and you know someone who's struggling, be there for them. Don't be like my hockey coach. Don't push them away because they're struggling. It doesn't make anyone weaker. It doesn't make anyone less of a person. Anything, I think it makes people stronger. I feel like I can never really go back to the place that I was in because I've, I've already you know, taken steps to get to where I am now, and I can only go forward from here. There's just this power behind sharing what you feel. I kind of started recognizing my own worth. And it's like no one's setting me free, I'm setting my own self free. It's the hardships that make you brave. It's the hardships that build you up and prepare you for whatever is next. Everyone goes through something. The most important thing is for one person to start that conversation. So I have this one very distinct memory from my childhood in Russia, which is me sitting on this windowsill in my mom's bedroom. And I would look in the distance and watch all the trains go by. And there was this one, it was called the Subsan, that I was literally obsessed with. I never thought I'd be able to go on that train because my dad told me how expensive it was and how hard it was to get a seat. A few years later, my dad surprised me with tickets. And so me, my sister, and my dad, we all went from Moscow all the way to St. Petersburg. It was a really special moment because I started to envision all the places I wanted to go and all the things I wanted to do in my life. The one thing about those visions is that they always felt very strong and clear and vivid, as though there would be nothing in this world that could prevent me from attaining them. But I think when I first started experiencing anxiety and going through my eating disorder and experiencing my depressive phases, I didn't have any energy left to pursue those visions. and. And it just makes me really sad to think about it and also just frustrated because I spent so many years of like probably one of the most critical stages in my life, my teenage years, just battling one internal conflict after another in silence. And it sucks. And it sucks because I know that whether they're young people or adults or just, just humans in general who go through mental illness, they think so badly about themselves because of the mental struggles that they're experiencing, when in reality, they have all of the potential that anyone has to accomplish anything that they've ever wanted to. And I feel like that ambition that I've had ever since I was little is what keeps me going on a daily basis. And it's something that reminds me there's always going to be really amazing people that I will meet. And there is always more. 
whether that's in you know in a day or a month or a year like life isn't just this and that I should keep holding on and so I did I'm Anastasia Vlasova, and it's our turn to talk. Thanks for listening.